Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, now we have the opportunity to have a live panel. We have our uh, keynote speaker, Mark Palmieri, on. We have uh, Jody Streich on, and we also have Dr. Dina Bono on. Excuse me, <laughs> Dr. Dina Bono on. So um, we have the, the, there's two individuals in our Epilepsy Foundation Long Island uh, partner agency that has been fielding the questions just the entire time. And they're gonna get to as many questions as possible throughout this uh, half hour time segment. So uh, I, I turn this section over to both Janet and Irene and also our panelists. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and thank you to our panelists um, for joining us and making their time available. Uh, Mark, thank you for sharing your powerful journey with epilepsy and being brave enough to acknowledge your fears and anxieties in raising a child with epilepsy. And Dr. Streich and Dr. Bono, thank you for making yourselves available this Saturday morning to help to support and educate our community. Um, there have been many questions that have come in regarding receiving uh, the slides from these presentations or recordings. Um, and so um, I want to say that we will be sharing the recording of the conference with all attendees. Um, and Dr. Bono has um, agreed to make um, her slides available uh, as well. So we will be following up after the conference with, um, with resources. Um, there was also a general question about how uh, how do we find out about um, a listing of epilepsy centers and what, what each specializes in? And I'm assuming by that, that you mean uh, the uh, comprehensive epilepsy centers for treatment um, and not the individual foundations. Um, and if you uh, Google um, level four comprehensive epilepsy centers, you can find a list of those centers and where they're located. Um, I'm not sure whether they actually state what their specialties are, but then you would have to look at each individual uh, center to, to see what, what, what those specialties might be. Um, okay, so um, there are a lot of questions, um, especially for Dr. Bono, but I'm going to start with a comment. First of all, um, Mark, thank you, someone put in. Mark, thank you for sharing so openly and powerfully. Um, and for Mark, there is a question. Um, I've noticed that seizures are almost always portrayed on TV medical shows as an emergency. How can we get a script where epilepsy is more realistically portrayed? Uh, great observation. Um, you know, I've had lots of conversations. I try to bring this up uh, as much as I can. I, I completely agree. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have much of a problem with their being portrayed as emergencies. So, you know, clearly they, they often are classified as emergencies. Um, but what, what, you know, what I hope to see is, you know, um, epilepsy having that um, breakthrough mainstreaming um, of, you know, of the condition of, of a of, of, of a, the varying perspectives on the condition of, you know, in terms of how many people are affected by it, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a mainstream piece of storytelling, maybe that a television character, a, you know, a novel, um, a movie, you know, we don't have our Philadelphia, we don't have our Rain Man, you know, we don't have the name it, you know, movie that engages cancer um, and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's such an enormous way, you know, this is movies, popular storytelling media, you know, this is the way so many things become normalized in, in, in the, in the common discourse. And I am amazed having written a book now, you know, that, that with an epilepsy theme, uh, how few, of these are out there. You know, there are books out there. People have written um, a number of narrative books I'm talking about, I'm not necessarily talking about medical books, you know, which are so essential, obviously. Um, 
but epilepsy has been treated in writing and in, in, in literature of one sort of another from sacred texts, you know, back to the Mesopotamians. Some of the earliest writing we have, 3,000, 4,000 years old, addresses seizures uh, all the way till today. And yet, you know, I, I'm not sure I can name three mainstream characters. Uh, what I mean is, you know, in famous characters that have epilepsy. Um, it's a mystery to me. I, you know, I, I certainly, I mention that as much as I can. My, my, my book is under option for, for the movies. So we'll see, we'll see. Um, um, and, uh, but, but, you know, uh, in all seriousness, it is something that just hasn't happened yet and would be really helpful. Um, and I, I don't know why it hasn't happened. It's clearly a lifestyle, a challenge that offers infinite dramatic possibilities and character exploration. So as a writer, you know, I have to just objectively see, you know, the opportunities of, of this very human reality in terms of storytelling, it's a mystery. So I'm trying um, for sure. So uh, to answer, it's a good, great observation. And uh, I, I, for one, am trying. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Dr. Bono. There are many, many, many questions for you. So I'm trying to um, condense them, but um, here we go. Um, is there evidence that THC cannabis use makes people susceptible to seizures in a similar way as alcohol use? And have any studies been done regarding the use of cannabis for epilepsy? A very common question, I would say, and a good one. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, studies necessarily that suggest that THC in and of itself is um, sort of a, a seizure provoking chemical in the way that um, alcohol can be. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's a medication available called Epidiolex, which is um, a purified form of cannabidiol from the marijuana plant, which is one of the many chemicals that's contained in the marijuana plant. Um, but there haven't been uh, well-designed studies necessarily of cannabis as a whole, um, but that chemical compound from cannabis is found to be helpful for seizures, and for some patients, uh, that medication can be can be a helpful one. Thank you. The next question: um, My husband started to have seizures after the COVID booster. Have you heard of this? Um, I not commonly. Um, I've heard of some of my patients that have epilepsy that after uh, a vaccination sometimes have a breakthrough seizure. Um, I recently read that, I haven't read the actual report, but there's a new report out, I think it came through my email yesterday, um, that apparently there's an association between COVID infection um, even mild infection and developing epilepsy later in life, which I think remains to sort of be determined, or even in the next six months after a COVID infection, um, that there's a higher risk for having a seizure or having being diagnosed with epilepsy um, in, in a population that has had COVID, even those that have not been hospitalized. So um, I think, you know, there's evidence that the infection itself may predispose people to seizures. Um, but uh, so, the, so I'm not aware necessarily of the vaccination leading to um, epilepsy in and of itself. Um, does nicotine influence epilepsy? I have some patients that seem to be sensitive to it, yes. And so they have quit smoking um, and sometimes get better control of their seizures. I can think of one elderly woman in particular who, who's had an observation that when she smokes, she's more likely to have a seizure. Um, so it can be a trigger for some. Um, my daughter is experiencing blurry vision and eye pain. She is on levetiracetam, clobazam, rufinamide, zonisamide. Um, seizures are not controlled. Any advice? Well, if uh, she is not part of a comprehensive epilepsy center, I would perhaps seek one of those out. And actually, I wanted to add to your advice of how to seek out epilepsy centers and determine um, what services are offered. The National Association of Epilepsy Centers, NAEC, is an organization and a website that you can go to 
um, that lists uh, epilepsy centers that have met the criteria to be certified by that national organization. And you can also see, you know, at what levels, level four offers certain services, level three offers a diff different set of services and so on. So you can get a general idea of what centers in your area should be able to offer through that website. Um, but the, you know, the, going back to this individual's question, um, I think, uh, you know, I can't give any individual medical advice necessarily, but I think a conversation with the neurologist is needed. Um, this could be related to medication side effects. Many times people that require multiple medications can have side effects like that, um, and it should be addressed. Thank you for um, for mentioning NAEC. I couldn't remember the name of the organization, so thank you so much. Sure. Uh, um, uh, so there's a question here uh, about how successful are surgeries. That is very patient specific. Um, in the best case scenarios, generally, um, a patient that is what we call what we call lesional epilepsy, so someone that has something on the MRI scan that we can see that we think is the reason for the seizure. So for example, some people have blood vessel malformations in their brain, something called a cavernous malformation um, that can predispose them to seizures or other people may have some scarring in the temporal lobe called mesial temporal sclerosis. Those folks tend to be in the best outcome categories um, for being seizure free after surgery. And that means that some, you know, some folks could be have a 70 to 90% chance of being seizure free after a surgery. That's not without medicines, though. So that's often something that I have to be really clear to patients about is that many people remain on medications, sometimes just one, uh, but most folks still remain on a medication after they have a surgery, even if they become seizure free. But that's a decision, to, you know, to, to be worked out. Um, and then the outcomes sort of decline from there for people that don't have an obvious abnormality on their MRI scan to explain the seizures. Great, great answer. Um, are there any other dietary changes that help absent seizures besides the keto diet? Um, some people just, uh, you know, just doing lower carbohydrates. So maybe not going so strict as to be on a ketogenic diet and putting yourself into that state of fat burning, but sometimes focusing on that low glycemic index diet that I mentioned, where you try to eat healthier carbohydrates or more complex carbohydrates. Um, some people notice, you know, eliminating uh, really simple sugars like, like sodas um, or, or, uh, a lot of sweets, people that eat a lot of sweets, some folks will notice that by doing those things, they may um, have a reduction in their seizures. But I can't, there's not a lot of other um, things beyond sort of uh, trying to limit carbohydrates. Sometimes limiting caffeine um, may help because some folks also seem to be sensitive to caffeine in terms of provoking seizures. Um, but it's really, really those, those carbs. Um, this is also, uh, you know, a very individual sort of question or uh, based on the individual, but what are the effectiveness rates of the three devices, the RNS, VNS, and DBS? Um, so I sort of think about the, R the potential um, benefits of the RNS and the DBS in general being about similar, um, meaning that it most people do not become seizure free with those devices, but they can have significant reduction in their seizures somewhere up towards, you know, um, between 50 and 70% in, in the best responders. But that is over time because it takes time for these devices to be programmed and adjusted um, to have their maximal effect. The VNS, um, you know, some people can be excellent responders and have perhaps similar outcomes, but I generally tend to think of it as, as the potential for a really great outcome of seizure reduction is a bit less than, than with the other two devices. Okay. Um, this question is about uh, whether there is a laser surgery option for corpus callosotomy, and if so, does that require anesthesia? Waking up from anesthesia has proven to be too big of an issue, causing too many seizures. Um, any surgery that would be a corpus callosotomy would require anesthesia to undergo it. 
Um, my daughter had a shunt in place since birth. At the age of 10, she started experiencing seizures. She does have an implant on the side of her head, which her neurosurgeon is able to turn up or down. Um, so I guess that was a, uh, a comment. Um, I don't really see a question there. I'm, I'm sorry. But if you do have a question, um, please you know, put it into the uh, chat. Um, can you give an example of fats for the diet? Uh, yes. Yeah, so fats, they tend to be things that we add to our food in order to boost the fat content. So um, when we're counseling patients on the diet and to add fat, we tell them to use things like real butter, heavy whipping cream in place of milk, for example, um, uh, oils. So they use lots of different types of oils. So you do this in preparing the food. A lot of times you make sure that, for example, if you're making scrambled eggs, you scramble the eggs in a lot of butter, perhaps add oil. If you're a person who likes to mix milk into your scrambled eggs, you use heavy cream instead of, um, instead of milk. Uh, um, but other good fat sources would be, you know, bacon. People, people eat a lot of bacon sometimes when they're on this diet. Avoca avocados are great if, if people like that. Um, and then it's really the butters, oils, mayonnaise, things like that. So it's more about adding that to the foods, to your proteins and to your vegetables. Um, when seizure activity is due to a genetic mutation, does diet affect the control of the seizure of this seizure activity? Diet can be helpful for any type of epilepsy. Um, there is a, there are a few, uh, you know, conditions where we cannot use dietary therapy and they can be genetic conditions because the person, the person's system is not able to process fat the way that someone without that genetic mutation um, can process fat. And there's actually a few genetic conditions where the diet is absolutely preferred, like something called GLUT1 deficiency syndrome, where um, the person actually cannot transport sugar, glucose appropriately from their blood into their um, cerebrospinal fluid. So their brain is relatively deficient of glucose and the ketogenic diet provides sort of an alternate fuel source for that person. Um, but in most genetic conditions, the diet can be helpful. So um, many other questions have come into the, um, into the chat. Um, I want to give Dr. Bono, a break for a second. Um, we will be coming back to you, but um, maybe I'll try to uh, share some questions that someone else on the panel can answer. Um, this one, um, especially for Dr. Streich, uh, there's a question here about hot yoga. Is that okay? Um, and uh, so maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about hot yoga in general, and um, if Dr. Bono uh, has any input on that, we welcome that as well. Jody, are you there? Okay, I couldn't unmute for a moment, but now I have the right to. Um, yeah, this is definitely, I would say, a, a question for Dr. Bono. I'm happy to um, discuss what I do know and, as always, seek your own medical slash neurological assistance in this. Um, we do know that experts have said that yoga in general helps to reduce cortisol levels, increase concentration, helps with sleep. You know, hot yoga is tricky. It's also known as Bikram yoga, and I'm certainly not an expert, uh, but I do know that there are known risks even for the non-epileptic population, such as dizziness and lightheadedness. There could be heat exhaustion. So um, I will defer this really to Dr. Bono, but as always, consult with your doctor. Okay. Dr. Bono, would you like to add anything yes, to that? Yes, sorry. I also had the, I won't mute myself again. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't had this particular question posed to me by patients before, but I think that I agree, agree with Dr. Strike that uh, 
yoga in general, I think would be something that would be beneficial because it can be, you know, sort of a form of meditation. And there's some evidence that, that, that meditation can help reduce anxiety. Anxiety can be a trigger for seizures. So anything that can help reduce that um, can be helpful, but, but hot yoga could be something, some people are very um, heat sensitive when it comes to their seizures and they recognize that as a trigger. And so I would have them avoid um, hot yoga. Thank you. Jody. another question for you. Uh, when someone is in the hospital for seizure observation for days, are there recommendations for mental health wellness? Oh, certainly. And even Dr. Bono, which I so appreciate, I mean, the beginning of her presentation talked about stress. And so it's very much intertwined. So I hope, you know, this is really dependent on the, the disciplinary teams that are at these hospitals. Um, there are many that will now have and go out of the way to have a mental health expert um, be part of the grand rounds because it very much is interconnected, even when somebody has a hospital stay. So I I would be a proponent of that, absolutely. All right, let me see what um, we haven't gotten to yet. Okay, there, I'm going to um, handle one of the questions that came in about, um, will this be available to share? Our school district admins don't understand that epilepsy is more than seizures. Um, so I'd like to share that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be um, making the recording of this conference available um, as follow-up, but I would also urge you to check with your local um, Epilepsy Foundation in terms of what um, types of services they provide. I know that on Long Island, we provide a lot of work with, um, with the schools, training their staff, uh, familiarizing them with different types of seizures, and specifically to your question, the co-occurring conditions that might arise with epilepsy, how epilepsy affects cognition and well-being and mood um, and you know memory and uh, so on. So I would check with your local um, local epilepsy organization, depending on which county you live in. Okay, let's see. A lot more questions that have come in. There is a question about funding and I'm not sure who is for research. So I guess I'm gonna put this out there for um, whoever would like to tackle this, but um, what is the funding difference with research with research going to develop new anticonvulsants versus funding going toward other diseases and medications. Seems that there are fewer new medications and the answer may lie in the pharmaceutical companies. Epilepsy is not a sexy disease and doesn't have a media spokesperson as other medical conditions do. A negative stigma persists around, still persists around epilepsy. How can more research funds be allocated for research and medical development? Excellent question and not one that I think I can answer, unfortunately. I still, I think that, you know, developing medicines takes a very long time. Um, so there are other medications in the pipeline. It's very, there's a sort of very active uh, pipeline for medications, for devices, um, basic science, trying to understand more about epilepsy. How do people develop it? Why does it worsen in some people and not in others? Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of different aspects of this disease and different levels of this that people are trying to study. Um, and sometimes that's not, uh, it's not necessarily something that's in the media or being publicized uh, because it's not at the point at which, you know, it would be available to people. But I, you know, I can say that um, our American Epilepsy Society meeting is growing every year uh, and there's tons of research being, you know, um, presented uh, every year. So people are working on it. Uh, but I'm not sure. I wish there was a public spokesperson for this disease. I know of, you know, you know that there's celebrities out there that have it or um, sports figures, um, you know, coaches on the sidelines that have seizures, but nobody really comes forward to, to, to be that, you know, Michael J. Fox, for example. Mark, did you want to add something to that? 
Uh, no, I, well, yeah, um, many discussions about, um, you know, also what, what, what is the funding for? There's two, you know, what, what I'm finding, of course, many of the uh, Alliance and Foundation chapters is that, that question of, you know, raising money for, of course, a cure, of course, medication, but also, um, you know, equipping the, the patient's world with opportunities, you know, um, some of the amazing work that that is done for for children, you know, providing summer camps, for instance, where uh, you know children can go away, uh, and and parents can can you know actually have a a few days where they're where they're alone because they know that there that 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 there's been um, you know uh, care taken to make it safe uh, and accessible for uh, people with epilepsy to enjoy things that would otherwise be kind of considered you know, expected and normal for, for people without a seizure disorder. So there are, you know, there, there are many, um, there are many things for which fundraising is, is needed, um, you know, not, not only in the, in the commercial, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industry, but just for the lifestyle um, and access for, for people with, with seizures. Yes, I agree. A lot of people at work uh, on it, we can, we can certainly use celebrity representation and, you know, unfortunately, I think most people hear of it when we lose someone, when when a celebrity has a has a, a crisis, or even or even um, you know even uh, dies, um, and, and it becomes a news item for a limited period of time. Um, and you know, we we all, as I said earlier, wait for that kind of mainstream focus to turn it more into that, as someone put it. This <laughs> it's strange to say, but a sexy. Uh, subject, you know, um, and, and something that appeals to everyone in some way that's so common. Yeah. And, and um, Allison, I see that you're raising your hand. Mike, can you unmute Allison? Yeah, he has. Thanks so much. Uh, so for those who don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm up in in this stream at some point, but uh, I run the Legal Defense Fund at the Epilepsy Foundation of America. And we have a t an advocacy team there uh, that um, spends a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And one of the things we advocate for every year is an increase uh, in funding for the CDC that is epilepsy specific. And we have been successful every year that we've been doing that to get an increase. Uh, I can't tell you the total number as I sit here because I didn't really prepare for that subject. Uh, but there are people that are constantly working on increasing at least the government side of funding. Uh, and also we uh, every year do uh, a Shark Tank project. If you're familiar with it, fund uh, up and coming uh, devices uh, and other things. Um, we specifically, uh, we have a contest and we fund the, the thing that we think is the most likely to help the greatest number of people and become successful. Uh, so there are in fact people working on always working on getting more money. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, there is a question here about, uh, there are a couple of questions about looking for local support, support groups. Um, I know that, you know, our um, epilepsy focused agencies uh, do run uh, support groups uh, for most of us. Uh, I will speak for us on Long Island. We, we definitely have support groups. Um, and uh, so again, get in touch with your local epilepsy foundation uh, to find out what types of groups they offer. Um, in our follow-up, um, I think that we will uh, give you contact information for the various uh, epilepsy, local epilepsy foundations. Could I just add yes. um, that I actually do run a support group, a women's support group that meets once a month through this foundation. Um, and it's done, it was audio, but now it's also on a, a HIPAA compliant Zoom platform. And I believe that somebody else does offer a men's support group. So right here in Albany, we have our own groups. So something else to consider. Great. Uh, let's see. Um, so I have to go back to Dr. Bono now. Um, can an implanted device be used if a patient has a VP shunt? Yes. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Was it prepared for such a quick, easy answer? 
Uh, <laughs> I can let's explain see. more. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let me find that. Uh, let's see. Just want to remind everybody we have a, a few more minutes of flexibility to continue our chat or to continue our questions. So um, our, our next presentation is coming up in about five minutes. Okay. Um, is there a blood test that can help determine which medication may work? Ugh, I wish, but no, unfortunately, no. It's still very much a trial and error um, sort of disease. And, you know, honestly, that's pretty much all of medicine, but um, because our medicines work in the brain, uh, you know, we recognize that they can have a lot of side effects and, and a lot of side effects that could be very bothersome. And it can be a really frustrating process for patients to have to uh, go through this trial and error process until we find the right combination. And hopefully we do. But, um, you know, there's, uh, there are some people that have asked me about genetic testing for like liver enzyme profiles that can explain how a person can metabolize a certain medication. But unfortunately, that doesn't tell us anything about how effective a medication will be. When looking at diets like the keto diet, have there been studies done on eliminating red 40 dye and or the silica found in certain waters? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, let's see. My son has had genetic testing two times to see if he has the epilepsy gene many years ago. No match was found at the time. What is the status of DNA research and epilepsy genes? Uh, so if it, I would say if it was done, you know, more than a decade ago, it may be worthwhile revisiting that question because um, there are always new genes for epilepsy being discovered. Um, and especially in um, childhood onset or infantile onset epilepsies, where the, the cause is otherwise not clear, um, many of those uh, children can be diagnosed with a genetic condition or have discovery of a genetic condition that predisposes them to, towards epilepsy. Um, in a lot of cases, though, it's still going to come back with these um, results called variants of uncertain significance, abbreviated VUSs, where we all just have sort of um, small changes in different genes that may be associated with epilepsy, but uh, it's not known in a lot of people whether that is a change that could lead to the epilepsy or if it's just because we're all different and we don't all have the same genetic code and it may not matter at all. Um, but there's panels, uh, gene panels that are re much more readily available now than they used to be. They're much more affordable if insurance doesn't cover it. So I work with a particular company or I send um, genetic testing to a particular company where if we cannot get insurance to pay for the genetic testing, um, it costs no more than $250 out of pocket for the for the individual. So that's a lot more attainable for a lot of people than it used to be. Uh, do you know if women with catamenial epilepsy can take hormone and take hormone therapy as well as seizure meds? Are they able to stop the hormone meds to become pregnant? So is the question that um, someone has catamenial epilepsy, takes seizure medications and some hormonal therapy in order to control seizures and then wants to become pregnant and go off the hormonal therapy? That's what it sounds like. Um, yes, I think it would have to be, you know, a discussion of the potential risks and benefits if it's, if it's felt that that hormonal therapy was very, very effective and helpful for the seizures, then there would have to be sort of a discussion about um, again, the risks and benefits of, of uh, trying to go, you know, become pregnant versus the chances of breakthrough seizures um, in that individual. Um, I guess we'll try for one or two more questions here. Um, how do seizures begin to generalize again if you've had a CC, and I'm assuming that's a corpus callosotomy? Mo many times, um, the corpus callosotomies that are done are not complete. A lot of times they are just two thirds of the corpus callosum. So it goes from the most anterior portion. So the most front portion of it, two thirds back. Um, and so it's possible that it 
that it could uh, generalize because of uh, those fibers in the posterior region, the back region that remain. Um, there are also other connections between the two sides of the brain um, that are deeper and smaller um, and not, not that big bundle, but it's possible that they could also, the, the two hemispheres could still talk to each other through, through those other pathways. Thank you so much. Um, we have run out of time and we need to get to the rest of our program. Any questions that we have not been able to address, um, we will try to address after the conference uh, directly with the uh, person who asked.